Thank you much for the uh, kind uh, invitation and introduction. So it's Friday afternoon. I'll try and keep it to 30 minutes so we can make it very interactive. You can ask me uh, questions as I go along um, and uh, make it very, very informal. So, you know, unless you've been uh, imprisoned in a soundproof room, you're going to know all the basics about <coughs> Ebola and Ebola virus disease. So, obviously, the big difference of this outbreak compared to past is that this was in uh, West Africa in the past, it's more located uh, in Central Africa. That the only reason that we have these vaccines and therapeutics ready to go into the clinic isn't because our government was very uh, forward thinking and prepared us for this, it's because of um, something called Project Bioshield, which was initiated by George Bush Jr. after the attacks of 9 11. So that was a program of 14 billion US dollars to develop medical countermeasures against anything that um, could be used against uh, the US uh, population and Ebola was uh, on, in category A, and that's why they invested in the, in the three uh, vaccines and diagnostics and therapeutics. So uh, uh, quite a lot known about the virus. A lot of this funding, again, came from, from US government. Um, and we know that it's decorated in this, uh, these glycoproteins, which has a target for things like um, uh, ZMAB and the plasma therapy, and also the, the, the numerous vaccines that have been in the clinic. And then we also uh, know a bit about the polymerase, its essential role in replication, and that's the target for this drug, uh, Favipiravir, that got trialled uh, out in, uh, primarily uh, in Guinea. And I've got a question mark over the bat, because it's easy to blame the bat for everything, mm -hmm. and probably is responsible for a, a lot of the uh, emerging disease issues that spill over from wildlife, red wine to humans, be it rabies or, or Marburg, was a lot of evidence. But for... Uh, Ebola, there's not so much evidence. There are some sporadic uh, reports, so also there are some good reports of um, partial genomes from Ebola that have been isolated from bats, and there's some bat zero epidemiology as well, but it's far from complete evidence that they are the, uh, the, the culprit, or at least the sole culprit. So I'm, I'm here, my, my day job is with Public Health England, but all the work I did for the Ebola response and all the work, the collaborations I was involved with were actually funded through the European Mobile Lab, the European Union, um, and more recently with the US government. But there's a very smart guy called Stefan Gunther who, in 2012, had the foresight to try to get high containment laboratories uh, in Europe to join uh, a little group called um, the, this mobile laboratory, European Mobile Laboratory. And we all signed up. Roger Hewson, a uh, colleague I worked with, was the guy that represented uh, PHE Porton Down. And they went to uh, the development agency of the EU in 2012, got some funding <coughs> for Mobile Laboratory Unit 4 for emerging diseases in, in Africa. And the system would be that you have a lot of civilians, uh, scientists like many of you in the lab, in the, in the um, uh, audience here, but we would train you to work in um, uh, uh, trying conditions to do diagnostics with, with high containment pathogens. So the training was provided by the German military biomedical uh, unit in, 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 in Munich, and everything that was going to be used in the lab had to fit in one of these orange boxes. So we could get into a uh, commercial flight, get in the back of a, an SUV. You didn't need the military to help you, uh, basically. So Gail mentioned uh, some samples that were taken before we knew that the uh, hemorrhagic fever cases in Gekudu region was caused by Ebola. But uh, some samples with the help of the Guinean government and MSF were uh, shipped out to Europe, both the Weather Docking Institute, to Stefan's group, and also the P4 lab in Lyon to uh, assess for if it was it last, <coughs> it last was quite common uh, in, in that region. Uh, but the mortality rate was a bit too high for Lassa. So the diagnostics was performed. Uh, Stefan and uh, our colleagues in, in Lyon within 24 hours showed it was uh, Ebola Zaire and the data that goes immediately to, to WHO, to their global response unit. And so uh, within, again, another 24 hours, they asked Stefan to mobilise the European Mobile Lab and get them out to, to Gekadu to support the MSF uh, treatment centre that had just been hastily established there. 
So they, from that three days, they got a unit uh, together at, at Munich Airport with all their orange boxes ready to go. And then um, that night, land in Conakry. The uh, next day, you drive round uh, Sierra Leone and uh, end up in, in Gekadu, which is obviously just over the border from Liberia and, and just over the hill there uh, from Sierra Leone. So that's the epicentre of the outbreak. And you can imagine why it spread so quickly, because it's in a fantastic position to get across uh, the, all three countries. So keep on the date there. So what's a week later, there's a, a lab actually uh, active uh, in a tent at the um, uh, MSF treatment centre in Gekadu. And through that little gap there, you can see the, the treatment centre which, which that, that MSF established um, probably a week before. So now the lab can provide daily data information to um, the clinicians that uh, who had uh, Ebola and, and who had malaria or, or something else. So you didn't have to mix up people, etc. And also the bodies they found in the community were they Ebola positive or, or, or negative. So, um, and since this time, you know, the EM lab has got a great record of uh, delivering diagnostics, not just to uh, Gekadu, uh, where Roman and Joseph were, but also um, they had a trip over into Foya, into Liberia, and uh, down into in Sierra Leone. There's two labs in Sierra Leone as well. One run by our Nigerian colleagues um, that come under the EM lab umbrella uh, as well. So lots of, uh, a lot of, uh, that, that's an old number, uh, the number of diagnostics they performed. And we were lucky enough to be able to support a number of clinical trials. And we're also lucky enough to uh, get some more funding from the European Union to do some research on the samples that had been taken for diagnostic use. And a great um, step forward was Stefan Gunther's ability to persuade the Guinean government to let the samples leave Guinea and come to Europe for this research to be performed. And that's because uh, Stefan and the German government have been investing in uh, public health diagnostics in Guinea for many, many years. There was a good, strong and trusting relationship there. But all the samples that we have belong to the Guinean government. We're just uh, uh, caretakers. Uh, they can demand them back at any time and most of our research contains uh, Guinean uh, scientists as well. And a part of our commitment was the capacity building, and, and Raymond and Joseph are in Europe now as, as part of that. Early on, governments were, and, and, and scientists and, and newspapers were theorising about how bad this outbreak uh, was going to get and why it was so bad. And um, it was down to theories about the virus adapting to the host, um, mutating so quickly the vaccines wouldn't work, so the glycoprotein are changing, uh, etc. So to address this, because we had the samples at the Bernard Dock Institute, we could then pull out uh, t 15, 18 samples for the first 10 months of the outbreak from March 2014 to January 31st, 2015, and we sent those um, RNA, which actually RNA to Liverpool University where Julian Hiscox um, uh, got them sequenced for us, and then guys at Bristol University, Dave Matthews, worked out the consensus sequence, and then we talked to some really clever biomathematicians, mathematicians, um, both in uh, Liverpool with uh, Giorgio Palakis and uh, Andrew Rambo at Edinburgh University. They were, they were critical uh, guys. Um, so, so this is something that... Um, uh, Georgios did uh, right off with the, when the data came through uh, was to model when, well, first the mutation rate, and the mutation rate with, with Andrew's input as well was not as high as originally had been uh, thought from a paper that was published in Science. So that paper was over a two, two week window and lots of deaths, and lots of replication, but only a two week window. And it gave a, maybe an inflated uh, figure for the, for the mutation rate. But because we had 10 months, we get much more accurate mutation rate, which is actually works out about two base changes um, for every month. So not as high as flu, but still with what you expect from an RNA virus. And, it, and what you want as a, as a molecular epidemiologist, um, you do want change, and you can track the virus um, uh, more, more, more easily. But Giorgio, in his modeling here, you can work out um, when the virus was introduced into the human um, reservoir. And he 
and, and Andrew backed this up, uh, estimated it came in about December 2013. And just so happens that that, that uh, agrees with that really romantic science they call epidemiology, um, where you have to ask the right question on the right day to the right person and hopefully get an honest answer. But they got it right because they also, um, in their investigation, um, put it down to a young child interacting with, with bats that were burnt out of a tree where they were, where they were nesting. And, and that was uh, believed to be uh, the index case. If that was the index case, we don't know, but it sounds about right with the uh, molecular modelling. This is just looking at the uh, amino acid changes in the different parts of the genome, and this one I highlight that in the glycoprotein, in that first 10 months, there were some changes at different positions, and there was an, an A to a V in position 82 that seems to be quite common and therefore probably had an advantage to the virus as well. And scientists are now looking uh, at the different mutations within different genes to see what advantages they had uh, they give to the virus. You know, perhaps when um, we see the virus in, in semen or CSF for many, many months after uh, it's clear from the blood, there may be some clues in how the virus is, is adapting or or um, slowing down, and it appears that the mutation rate in those immune privileged sites is far lower. Uh, the molecular clock ticks far more slowly in those sites than it does in blood. And again, why is this? And we need to work out the mechanism. So this is a beast analysis where you uh, look at phylogenetics, so the relationship between different isolates and different strains that you found, different samples that you've uh, diagnosed and sequenced over time. So the 180 genomes are on here, but these are from the Geary paper. There's about 76 genomes that came from the outbreak in Callaghan in late May, early June 2014. So you can see that in, in Gekadu, uh, all the uh, samples are very closely related to each other. They, these are just the different villages as it was moving uh, uh, through the area uh, in, in the um, prefect of, uh, of Gekadu. <coughs> Um, obviously, here is a very close relationship between a virus that then a sample that went down to start the Callaghan outbreak. So, this uh, there is a theory that there was a, a big funeral from a um, from a natural healer. She was very popular. People came up from Sierra Leone to to that funeral uh, and may have taken it down uh, with them because this is all a uh, Kissi um, ethnic uh, group, which uh, Raymond is. And they don't. Why should they respect political borders that Europeans have devised? And so there's a lot of movement from that part of Liberia and Sierra Leone and, and Guinea. And then there was a, a large uh, outbreak in, in, in this part of uh, bordering um, uh, Guinea, Callaghan, and then it was re-exported back from um, Sierra Leone in blue back to Guinea, back, in, back to Gekadu. So there was a wave, initial wave, then it went down, then it went back up again. Uh, and that's what we can see uh, through, through this diagram. And when I showed that diagram to the WHO and uh, Guinean authorities in Conakry, they could see the value of sequencing and, and epidemiology. They were all epidemiologists, by the way. And I made a similar joke, and they did, they did laugh at it. And, uh, and they did say, so you don't need us anymore then, Mars. And I said, well, <laughs> uh, that's not quite right. We obviously need to work. We, we're here to help with some, with some uh, genetics to help you in your, in, in your job. Um, so we agreed to work in partnership, but what they agree asked for is not to have data 10 months later, they wanted it in real time, given sequencing data immediately. So I remember that there was a, um, uh, so all this obviously was done in big, uh, um, expensive, complicated platforms in, in, in Europe um, on, on a Illumina um, high seat. But which are not really feasible out in Guinea. Though Ian Goodfellow from Welcome to Us at Cambridge has put a big sequencer in Sierra Leone, he's done an amazing job. But I heard this little thing here called a, a minion, or a minion, if you're talking to your children, made by a company in Oxford, could do NGS. And um, you know, was it just a, 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 a dream? Was it a lie? Or was it was it real? So I. Um, when I got back to the UK, I asked around, I was told a guy called Nick Lohman at Birmingham University is a, a real expert in this little bit of kit. And we got talking, explained what I wanted to do, and he was already one step ahead of me because he'd already worked out how to do it for Ebola, but collaborating with guys at DSTL, the EMOD, um, across the wire from us down in Portland Down. But he couldn't get out to Sierra Leone because of politics or the rest of it. 
So within, within 10 days, we said, uh, have somebody ready, and we'll bring them to um, uh, Dunk Hospital in Conakry. We can get samples from Koya, uh, where Raymond and Joseph have moved down from Gekadu, which is just north of, uh, of, of Conakry, the capital. And we can test it out in, in the field. So you know, massive advantages um, of, of, how, of, of delivering real-time sequencing. And this, uh, because Nick is clever, because he's a medic, he didn't go, he sent his PhD student, um, uh, Josh Quick, who is an amazingly uh, able individual. And um, he just had a couple of uh, big bags that he checked in with some laptops, the min-irons, the enzymes and things in a, a little cooler box, uh, a PCR machine. And within 48 hours, he'd um, got the full uh, sequence of, of two strains, two different samples that had come down from the Koya lab that uh, Sophie Durafour, who, who, who worked with Joseph and Raymond, had brought down with her. And immediately we worked out that the viruses circulating now around the capital weren't from Sierra Leone, where we thought they were from. One of them was. The other one had come directly down from Gekadu, probably on that road route, um, uh, as most of the pathogens travel around transportation routes. So uh, quickly, um, Sophie then uh, learned the, the, the technology and uh, took it back to, uh, well, she got a little, a little mini lab built in Koya from a very um, uh, enterprising Lebanese guy uh, who managed to get a little air conditioned unit for us uh, at, the, at the treatment center in Koya. And this is uh, Joseph and, and Raymond who then um, were able to do the full genome sequencing of the samples so that were shown to be positive in Koya, but also uh, all the other areas um, that had positive still cropping up the RNA was then all shipped to this unit so we could have a central sequencing facility and feed that data into the epidemiologists. So uh, Nick uh, and, and Josh et al. in the UK were receiving the data as people like Raymond Joseph and Sophie were generating it and then um, developing these maps uh, colour-coded to say where were the last, when the last time that strain was seen, that fingerprint was seen, and we could help guide them to um, where they should uh, question uh, to break uh, and find out the transmission chain so it could be, it could be broken. So that was, I think, one of the first times in the field that molecular um, uh, ge genomics and classical epidemiology were really coming together. So if you're really, really clever, so this is why I need a really clever IT person to switch over to that video, I ask. So um, Andrew Rambo, he's like a key uh, figure in all this, um, and everybody seems to trust him. Uh, so what you see now is a, a system, okay, so what he did, he uh, looked at the 1500 sequences that everybody was feeding him in, and his PhD student, he managed to look at the relationship of the virus, where the virus was uh, diagnosed, and the time, and then made a video of the outbreak in 60 seconds of the virus leaving around. This is what you're seeing now. So that's Gekadu, um, going to the centre. Uh, Kisadugu, and then I've been to Liberia. And that was early on, didn't quite get to Conakry. So that's uh, the what, Callahan and then Freetown and, and Monrovia. And you're seeing the time uh, moving on. And obviously the size of that um, red dot determines the number of cases that were going on at, at that time. So the power of uh, molecular epidemiology is quite incredible. And when you see isolated flashes, a lot of that's due then to the sexual transmission cases that are occurring because there's no obvious direct intermediate link because these are coming up um, 6, 9, 10, 15 months after the virus is maybe cleared from that, that region. So there's a lot to uh, talk about uh, the vaccines that were there. There's one based on MVA, one based on chimp adeno, and the other one based on uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. So all... Uh, to some extent live, uh, uh, maybe one hit or multiple attenuated um, vaccine, viral vaccine vectors. And they all contain just the glycoprotein from Ebola Zaire. So, and also there's the, there was a trial on that was published in the General of Medicine recently, uh, led by the guys from Tropical uh, Medicine U uh, Institute in, in Antwerp, where they were taking survivors' plasma and using that to treat people that um, had uh, Ebola virus disease uh, as well. So when you know, uh, theoretically, if you're a survivor, you've got a, an immune response that protects you against re uh, reinfection. That's a theory. Don't want to really 
put it to the test. So if you understand what the survivor's immune response looks like, that's pretty good, give you an idea of what you need to induce for a vaccine response to some extent, the type of response, not necessarily the intensity of that response. So um, the, the, like I said, there's a chimp adeno vaccine, which um, uh, Sarah was involved and, and Adrian, and they gave me a cup of tea to get vaccinated uh, in, in, their, in, in their lab while they were uh, at their clinic. And it was a very different experience getting vaccinated in Oxford at Jenner compared to in uh, Conakry in the launch of their phase three vaccine uh, study. So this is the, VS, the VSV that um, has the, the glycoprotein insert. Uh, this is um, the, uh, our phase fr fr three regulated, uh, regulation inspection from the, Guinean, from the African um, authorities to ensure that the, the, two, the, the trial was up to standard. So there were two arms of this trial. One was to vaccinate 1,200 healthcare workers and look for um, side effects and immunogenicity to try to uh, link something with colors of protection. And, that, and um, members of my department, we were over at the time, managed to establish a facility and run it for 10 months for WHO and MSF. And then there was the ring vaccination study that was really spearheaded by this very, uh, very determined lady called Anna Maria, Colombian medic. And uh, she's the one who suggested I might want to also volunteer as a European. And uh, when Anna Maria suggests something, you, you just do it. It's just, it's just easier. <laughs> But this is a Donka hospital, and uh, we had a lab in there at one point and, and one, round, one round the corner uh, as well. So conditions were, were, were interesting. So in the ring vaccination study, uh, it's actually... So, so the team got information when there was a case in the village. They rushed in, and then they did about 100-person uh, ring vaccination around that central case. And so by that time that you get in, you're not looking to stop secondary cases, you're looking to stop actually tertiary or quaternary cases. And, and that was the treatment arm. The um, placebo or the control arm was that you went, you, you waited three weeks before you did the ring vaccination. So that's how they got their uh, comparative uh, data. And there's obviously lots of ethical issues around that. But it wasn't a placebo control trial. And... Um, you're probably aware that the Lancet paper that Anna Maria and colleagues wrote indicates that the vaccine uh, appeared to be quite efficacious in preventing these tertiary and quaternary um, uh, cases. Um, I believe that they've got more data that would be coming out soon that uh, will make it even uh, the statistics are somewhat stronger uh, as well. And because of the uh, recent case, there's a sexual transmission case uh, in Guinea at the moment. Um, there's also one, it appears, cases in Liberia. So they've used this vaccine to vaccinate about 1,500 people in the region, the forested region, where they, um, the sexual transmission case uh, appears to be. So I talked about looking at the immune response of survivors. We're not the first to do this. Our colleagues in the CDC did some very nice work uh, in, uh, on the back of the Kickwick outbreak in 95, and you can see that the immune response antibody uh, comes in quite quickly to, to Ebola and, and peaks, and it stays quite high for quite a long time. So this study was done a long time ago. It was done with very few people. We want to do it more comprehensively and also look at T-cell responses uh, as well. So we linked up with... Um, a guy called Sas Abbas, who Raymond Joseph know well, and uh, he is the leader of the survivors group in, in Gekadu. We also worked with a guy called uh, Kader Kondi, who's a clinician in Koya, and he linked uh, with the survivors group uh, in Koya. So we had two, um, two sites, Gekadu, the forest of region, and Koya, just north of Conakry. And we recruited about 50 or 60 survivors, um, um, persuaded them to give us uh, a blood sample, obviously going through full ethical approval uh, with, uh, in the country. And uh, Raymond and Joseph discussed with the uh, survivors what we were doing uh, and um, they took the signatures for, for their agreement. We're also interested in looking at these very special uh, ladies. And these are people that looked after individuals who were known to have Ebola virus disease, but, and they helped feed them, clear up their, 
body fluids, um, uh, but they never really got sick themselves. So why is that, and did they get an immune response? So let's, let's, have, a look, uh, let's have a look at that. So um, it's quite difficult to do immunology on site in, um, in, in, in Guinea, but we, le we believe we're the first people to do early spot in, 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 uh, in Guinea, and this was uh, Raymond and Joseph working with Vipa Hall, one of our scientists, um, when we set up the immunology lab uh, back in March uh, 2015. So early spots were done on site. And then um, samples of serum was also shipped back to Europe for uh, ELISA studies uh, on an activated whole virus and also uh, neutralization studies. And they were done by uh, a great team uh, run by Thomas Strecker at the Marburg uh, uh, lab. And then it's the same place that Adrian and Sarah used to do their neutralization assay. So we can do some nice uh, comparisons. So we see that there's quite a spread of uh, uh, ELISA activity and neutralizing activity um, from uh, the different survivors over, diff over different times. But what we can see, this red line here is my neutralizing antibody response, but I've had a prime and a boost, I've had adeno and, and VSV. I think normally with one shot of VSV or one shot of adeno, you're coming around uh, one in 20 around there. It's somewhere, somewhere around there. So I've, I think I've got quite a good neutralizing antibody response. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but really, these ladies, these contacts, um, a lot of them have got definite immune responses there, which um, suggests there was, a, a, there was a, a certain amount of virus replication uh, uh, somewhere in their bodies. The field diagnostics we used, the Altona uh, uh, Ebola uh, PCR, is uh, down to 10 to the 4 genomes per mil of blood. So that's, you know, we have got a limitation on what we're saying was negative out there. So because of this um, uh, observation with, with the <coughs> contacts, perhaps there's a, another a possible outcome after exposure, and that's this, you get infected, uh, you have mild symptoms, because they don't say, oh, I don't believe asymptomatic, you might just feel a little bit off colour, etc. Um, but your virus load may be below this level of detection, and virus load is related to uh, symptoms as well. So... In, in summary, there's lots of interesting things going on. Uh, diagnostics uh, at, the, at the site are early on is extremely beneficial to see what's going on with the epidemiology, also supporting clinical, clinical trials, etc. And this is, I'm just a spokesperson for a huge uh, international uh, effort. And uh, just to point out Stefan Gunther, who without him, a lot of this uh, wouldn't have been possible. Obviously, Joseph and Raymond, pivotal for our long-term long -term work in, in Guinea, and uh, good collaborators at Liverpool uh, and Bristol and Edinburgh um, were also key uh, as well. And obviously, funding is, uh, is essential. And um, so this is our, our lab. Uh, we call it the FDA lab because they're, they're paying for it. And that's in Gekadu. It's all been renovated. And uh, we were there with Raymond and Joseph doing the next um, bleed of the survivors uh, earlier this year. And they were there for the next five years. And, and Raymond and Joseph will be doing their PhDs there. So we'll have our supervisory meeting by Skype. So there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs>